So I'm very uh, glad to be meeting in the temple again. I didn't realize how much I missed it till I... (laughs) It is my favorite, uh, favorite place to meditate. So we, with Ajahn Yanamrato in the hospital with the, and his operation uh, for bladder cancer. So this is, I think this has uh, come as a shock to, it certainly was to him and to the rest of us because um, we haven't really had much of that kind of uh, sickness. Or that, that, yeah, you know, somebody that has a life-threatening disease, somebody, a monk or a nun. So uh, then Ajahn Natiko, uh, who also has his uh, strange, he doesn't have any enough blood platelets. In his latest email, he. He's supposed to have about 150 to 300 blood platelets. He has only, he had only three. And he gave some good news about it. It was up to 18. (laughs) So, I mean, these are ominous signs of, you know, the frailty of the human body and the the, uh, aging process. And uh, the, the just uh, in terms of dhamma, it's uh, reflecting on the way it is. Condition, condition, phenomena is impermanent. <coughs> and uh, and when we reflect in it this way, then we we really it very becomes very meaningful because it's not more not just a kind of of intellectual uh, acknowledgement of that, but you're, you're actually feeling it. You, Begin to see it in yourself, the aging process, or the, the when we feel weak or sickly, or get the flu, or whatever, it, or somebody else does. When somebody else has it, when we find out just the word cancer, uh, just that word itself has a very strong effect on consciousness. So when somebody says, you know, they have cancer. What do, you know? What is it? How does that word affect you? And uh, and cancer is a kind of, you know, it means a, a kind of life-threatening disease. Uh, uh, it's a mysterious ailment. We don't quite know why or what to do with it or how to control it or how to cure it. Uh, it still leaves us in a in a quandary because it's so many it, it it's not something that predictable or we can kind of wipe out through a vaccination or a, an injection of some sort. But then, in terms of reflecting, we're observing. It has, notice how words do have an effect on your consciousness. I remember a few years ago, I have these, this, uh, what they call uh, solar keratosis from living in tropical climates for, for so many years without uh, taking care of my delicate complexion. So I have a, a, I have a Nordic complexion. They call it a Celtic. I should live in Ireland or someplace. Britain, I think, is good enough, but... 
Celtic complexion means you don't have a lot of pigment. You've got very fair skin. So, so uh, this, this kind of skin does not uh, endure well in sunny, hot, or tropical countries. So then, uh, living so many years in the, tro to the tropics and coming to live here, then as I get older, the skin deteriorates and it's kind of elasticity is gone and it, it gets very scaly and easily becomes cancerous. So then they say, I've, I've, so I've had three cancer operations, but they're, they're just superficial. You know, they're like skin cancer, they're just little things that grow on your face and then the, it takes about five minutes to cut them out. But I remember announcing that I had the first one at morning breakfast, and then I'm going to have a cancer operation today, and then everybody goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And you know I'm a bit of a jokester, so. But, it <laughs> but that's, uh, you know, it's important to recognize, to reflect on how the, these words affect us. It's not to say we shouldn't be affected by them, or we should be completely equanimous. And, but we're noticing the way uh, the sense world does affect our consciousness, like language or tone of voice, or somebody looks at you in a certain way, or or doesn't. Somebody won't look at you. How do you feel? <laughs> and and so this is what we call reflecting on the way it is. The word cancer then is is a loaded word, and it's not that it you know that we shouldn't have we should be be totally equanimous when we hear it, but you know it's it, we're observing when that this what this word when we hear it, and especially when it's applied to somebody uh, you know very close to us or ourselves. And so we, we observe we the, the puto, the witness to the way it is. Like today at the hospital, Ajahn Yanabrata was saying how just the, the uh, when the doctor, one of the doctors told him, well, it, it seems to be rather, you know, superficial, the, the cancer, the, the lesions in the bladder, uh, they seem to be just superficial. So then that, that makes you, f they said that made him feel, well, that calm and uh, kind of, it's nothing to worry about. Well, it just seems, you know, it's, not, it's just superficial. It doesn't seem invasive. And then the next time the, another doctor said, well, we never know. It could be, you know, we've got it, it has to go to the lab and we have to prove that. It, and then suddenly, <laughs> He felt tense. <laughs> this is just, this is what being human is, is about, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, superficial, it means it, it's not dangerous, it's, uh, you know, curable, it's not all that serious. Well, we don't know, it could be, you know, it could be very invasive, it could, we don't know till the, and then the, then even the tone of voice becomes, full of this kind of, you know, we, you, just, you just can't take it for granted, you've got to have these tests and we feel the, the, uh, the, the effect of even the, the doctors, the way the doctor says it. Well, this is sensitivity. Uh, so like the Vedana Sanya Sankara, the five khandha, the, this is a sense realm sensitivity. Uh, this is this is the way it is that we're 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 kind of incarcerated in sensitive forms. What birth to death is the experience of being embodied in a in in a very sensitive state of consciousness. And by putting it in terms like this, then you know, 
we're looking at it in terms of what it is, not in, in other it's not personal then, is it? It's not, I'm sensitive and I'm too sensitive or not sensitive enough or, or you know, why is this happening to me? Why should I have this problem? Or why should a good monk like Ajahn Yanarato get this cancer? And, and the sensitivity, you know, is, is uh, if, we, if we just are caught into it, we never reflect or observe or notice the, the state we're actually experiencing, then, of course, life is. Uh, we, we create endless problems and complexities about it. Because the self or the ego, the Sakyaditi, is a complex creation of, uh, that, we, we, that we make. When I look at my ego or my personality, you know, it's a complicated personality. It's fraught with all kinds of fears and memories and and ideals and and whatnot that that uh, you know, if never questioned, never looked at, never recognized in terms of dhamma, in terms of the way it is, then then I do. I believe. I'm actually committed to to my personal feelings and my personal opinion and reactions. This is my world. It's me, full of myself and my uh, habits and my emotions and my memories. But when I observe it from through mindfulness, through sati sampatanya when I actually, then that's what I mean by taking the refuge in Buddha. So this, this word Buddha is awakened consciousness. It's consciousness in, in an individual human that is awakened to the way it is. So that's why, you know, you can have the Buddha images, you can make you know, a kind of human form, uh, because it, we're experiencing consciousness through this form, through a human body. And so, uh, the sensitivity then is, is recognized and reflected upon. If we were, if we had no ability to do this, if we didn't have this, this bhuto, or this awakened, natural state of awakened conscious reality in the present, we wouldn't, we would be just helpless victims of our emotions and habits. There'd be no way out of it. You just, you know, you would just be, be like a program. You press the button and, 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 you know, of happiness and you go, you're happy. You press the button of despair and you go to, to despair. We'd just be programmed, programs. You know, they just help us victims of the of the programming process. But because we have this this uh, ability to awaken and to observe and notice and reflect, and this is this is the, the you know the real essence of our lives is uh, here at the monastery is to is to um, awaken to the way it is now uh, this uh, in the Buddhist terminology then the Buddha knows the Dhamma <coughs> so and these are exotic words to us who are not native uh, Pali speakers <laughs> Or even from Buddhist countries, like in Thailand, you can say dumb and every it's a part of the Thai language. But it, that, that's why it is uh, taking these words. It helps because they're, they, you know, we're using them for reminding. They're not philosophical concepts. They're not met. They're not to be metaphysical theories. They're very. Uh, kind of 
skillful means, expedient means, using language, not to just get caught up in our thinking process and define and uh, everything through the intellect, but to remind, to awaken. So in this this Bhutto, this Buddha, is a, this the the word itself is waking up, wake up to Dhamma. And then Dhamma, reflecting on Dhamma is all conditions are impermanent. All Dhamma is not self. So then in Dhamma, you know, Dhamma is a, is a word that includes, you know, it's, it's everything and no thing. It's, uh, it's not meant to be defined and it's not meant to be philosophical. It's merely a convenience that we can use. So Dhamma is not, you know, we awaken to the way it is. So that's a, that, that is our ability to be mindful in the present. Because then we wake and do the way it is and we're aware of, of, the, of what we're feeling, of physical sensation or emotional uh, qualities, of emptiness or confusion, of uh, whatever, you know, we're, whatever the... We, you know, we recognize in consciousness is seen in terms of Dhamma rather than in terms of self. Now when we don't see it in terms of Dhamma then we, 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 it all becomes very personal. So I have cancer, I'm, why me? It's not fair, what have I done to deserve this? What is my bad karma? And, and it goes on and on like that. Or uh, you know, it, it, uh, I like or I don't like, I want to be respected and I don't want to be treated badly. And and the personality, uh, you know, we easily get pulled into that personal pattern, habit pattern. So then the, all conditions are impermanent is, you know, like this, the body is impermanent. So then we, you know, it seems quite obvious. You know, you're born and you know you're going to die. But that can be merely, just merely an intellectual um, attachment. You know, you, you've not really you, you know, just is a reasonable thing to say and to believe in. <clears throat> but as you, you know, as you begin to open to just the reality of, of the body as experience rather than as some kind of personal identity, it's different, isn't it? To just observe the pleasure, pain, sensitivity of uh, of your own body. It's, it's a, uh, pleasant, it's relaxed state or tense or different forms of pain or ache or stiffness. So they are observing it, being the, the knower that the body, that the, you know, you recognize the sensations that one is experiencing in the body, they're impermanent. They have no permanent uh, ability. If you observe pain or uh, physical discomfort, you know, you, you're more aware of it as impermanent. When you, when you just want to get rid of it, you know, when you just don't like pain or physical discomfort and you don't want it, then, then we spend the time resenting it, trying to get rid of it. So we don't really understand it yet. We're merely reacting because physical pain, physical discomfort is, is an unpleasant feeling and we don't like it. 
So this is, uh, so we, just by observing that, not wanting it, is, uh, is uh, my, from my personal, you know, I don't like pain and I don't want it. And from that, then the habit forms of just reacting to anything unpleasant, physically unpleasant, painful, or, or sens- sens- uh, sensually unpleasant or unwanted. We just don't like it, resist it, try to get rid of it, run away from it, feel threatened, averse to it, and, then, and so this is, we get caught in reactions. And so the personality is created around this. It's my problem, my pain, my, uh, whose fault is it? We also like to blame others for our unhappiness or our pain or misery or uh, misfortune. So in the taking the refuge in Bhutto Tamo and then and this, uh, you know, we're we're not saying we shouldn't blame anybody or should. We're not. It's not a matter of should or shouldn't anymore, but uh, going to a different place, being the, being aware rather than than being, uh, you know, trying to figure it out personally, or you know, whose fault is it? Because whosever fault it is, that's still very personal, isn't it? whether it's my fault or your fault or the Sangha's fault or whose fault, the government's fault. <laughs> it's still, that's, that, all that sense of fault is, is about personality. <clears throat> right and wrong, good and bad, is all highly personal. These are creations uh, that, we, that we, you know, because we think we can create these words. So we create a sense of of self and self-worth and and so forth with our language, with our thoughts, attachment to our memories. You know, you remember the past, the successes or failures uh, of your life. And that, those are, those seem very personal, you know, the, the good things, the the, the good times, the, the, the unfairness of my life, the things I resent, the things that shouldn't have happened, or the things I've done in the past that I shouldn't have, that I'm ashamed of or gu- feel guilty about. All this creates, reinforces the sakaya ditti or personal sense of it being personal. So in uh, observing this, observing, uh, you know, like remembering something I did in the past that I feel ashamed of. Now when I, you know, in, in, in reflecting on it, I begin to just observe this, this sense of, of uh, self, of me, and the past, and the feeling of guilt around some when this memory comes into consciousness, and so the, then this this puto, this awareness, attention to this, you're putting it in its in it, in its it, because it becomes an object in consciousness rather than you becoming a person, a personality. Uh, and see and experience your consciousness through these personal illusions. You see, so more and more as you begin to understand the Dhamma, you're not, you're no longer experiencing consciousness through your personal identities, but the pure consciousness that's natural, that isn't, that you don't create, that has no sense of a self. It's, you know, if I, if I, put self into that, that's my creation, it was a my consciousness. It's mine, my consciousness. This is, this, I'm creating those thoughts and those words and those identities. 
And that sense of me as a person, you know, is a, as a personality, is still, you know, it's a very powerful feeling to have a personality, be a person. But then, you know, with then the Buddha emphasized sati sampatanya. These are the words that can be awareness, awakened, conscious attention. So consciousness then includes everything. It's, you know, we're, we're not thinking of my consciousness as opposed to as something separate from yours. Because if I do that, it's a creation. I can create my sense of identity. I'm separate. I'm a different person. And my consciousness and my feelings and my thoughts. Now just notice when, when I think like this, if I observe this, then I, I do create this sense of, of separation. As a, as a, a me opposed to you. My experience is, you know, is like this and you experience it like that. Now when, when we begin to uh, have that awakening of consciousness, it's nonverbal. It's, it's not, we don't create it. We, we suddenly recognize it. It's not a personal creation that I, that I get through being a monk or, or practicing meditation even. It's, it's a, the kind of magic of just awakening to what is most ordinary, most natural, but maybe never, never recognized, never noticed, because we are so caught into our sense of separation and personal views and opinions. And we know, like living in a monastic community where everybody is, is rather, you know, we're all here you know, for the same, for the same reason, you know, we have a common goal. And yet how personal, you know, how strongly personal living with each other can become. It triggers off our love-hate relationships, fears and desires and attractions, aversions and jealousies and resentments and so forth, living with with a moral people who who have the same goal. So this personality then is uh, is not trying to get rid of it, but recognize it. So that your relationship to your personality is a knowing rather than trying to change your personality and to, to fit some ideal you have of what a good person should be. And that we all suffered in monastic life by trying to become uh, kind of, you know, good monks, good nuns, you know, with the ideals of, you know, having compassion and, and being mindful and, and understanding and sensitive to each other and sharing and all the good stuff, all the good ideals. And then we're never feeling we're really, you know, that, you know, feeling guilty or feeling uh, self-critical because maybe much of the time we don't feel like that. We feel annoyed or angry or irritated by somebody other than compassion or loving kindness or we feel jealous, or we feel angry, or whatever. We feel attracted, or fascinated, or averse, or whatever. And, you know, the idea we shouldn't. But the aim of, of being a samana, then, of being a monastic, is not to make ourselves in, to in, develop a, a, per, a saintly personality, but to get beyond the personality. Which doesn't mean we don't ever have a personality. It means we, we know what it is. We understand it. We're no longer limited, bound by these habits 
of, that we've acquired in our life through awakened attention, awakened consciousness. So then they, you know, really see, you know, the word consciousness itself, the English word. And it's real, isn't it? We're all conscious. We're all experiencing consciousness right now. And so it's, uh, and it's, uh, so it's, and then we want to, maybe you want to know what consciousness is. I remember when I first, you know, figuring out all the Pali terms and Buddhist concepts and that, and talking about vijnana and jitta and consciousness and you go to the Pali dictionary and vijnana is this and, 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 you know, in trying to get a definition of consciousness. You know, go to the library and, and look in a book. And then <laughs> suddenly it dawned on me, I'm experiencing, why don't, I don't need to find out what it is. You know, who's, well, how, how it's defined by some Pali scholar. I mean, it's, it's what I'm experiencing now. This is it, you know. And then the thinking mind wants to define it. Notice how that desire arises to define it and grasp it. Consciousness as something you, you know, you, uh, you get through definition, through, through, ob- through seeing it uh, as an object, through being able to say, this is it. And, uh, and you know, have it there. Is some something that you can observe, but you don't observe consciousness. You recognize it. It's like waking up, isn't it? So you know you're awake. That's it. But you can observe what you create into consciousness. You can observe the sensitivity of this realm we're living in. So, you know, we've got eyes and ears, nose, tongue, sensitive body, a brain. You know, so we, we experience and we live in a realm where these, these, these senses operate. So we, we're, you know, we're exposed. Once you're born, you're kind of exposed to the, to the sense realm. You know, it's, it's temperature, whether it's hot or cold, day or night, whether, what season it is, and whether it's attractive or unattractive, or pleasant or unpleasant. So the sense, senses, we can observe sensitivity because of consciousness. It understands, we can understand, we, uh, you know, literally, stand under, be aware of sensitivity as an object because sensitivity is is a changing thing. It, there's no permanent sense experience. You know, when you really observe sensitivity through, you know, through sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, thought, emotion, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, you can't, you can recognize, you can observe it like an object, like physical pain. I can observe it. You know, I have a pain in a, in my knee or something. I can I'm aware of it, pay attention to it. It's and my aversion to the pain. Wanting to get rid, I can observe that. There's an awareness. Suddenly, I feel I don't like this pain. I want to get rid of it. I can, I. But that, because because of consciousness, then desire arises to get rid of some painful sensation. So this is this is uh, you know like the puto, the Buddha knowing the Dhamma. So when we we take refuge. 
in Buddha Dhamma Sangha. This is this is the reality. This is the practical reality of Buddha Dhamma Sangha as a refuge. It's not a belief in Buddha and in some exotic words or concepts or metaphysical theories. It's very practical and if used properly, can be very helpful to you. So then even the sense of me and you, like you're sitting here in this high seat, if I just rest in pure awareness, I don't create a separation. There's no separation, but when when there's consciousness, I don't have to go unconscious. (laughs) I can be here, sitting here, on this high seat, and consciousness is is functioning, is operating, because that's its nature. It's everywhere, it's not just in, it's not just my brain, or it's not mine. And so, you know, you recognize that each one of us, individual bodies, is experiencing the the conscious form. So you're experiencing consciousness from where you are, where your body is at this moment. And then you can create the sense of, I'm this person, I'm this monk, I'm this nun, I'm... and... uh, I'm sitting here and I just made those up on the high seat. And then you start thinking, creating the, the world. Well, it's learning to, to recognize this pure consciousness, that sati sampachanya, sati panya, these words, that's what it's about. Recognize it. It's not something you get or you don't have now. It's just, not, we, 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 we're so, uh, you know, easily taken over by the self, by the ego, by the habit formation. So, you know, in terms of the, you have the body and it's conscious. So you have rupa and vinyana. They, these are, these are natural conditions. You don't create them, you know, you, you, you know, you don't create your body yeah, and you don't create consciousness. Sensitivity is being, is, is, the, is the physical, you know, it's the realm we're living in. It's just, you aren't creating sensitivity, but you create an identity with it. You like it or don't like it, want it or don't want it. Then we have a memory retentive memory so we can remember things that happened 20 years ago or last year or whatever and it happened to me and that's how the cultural conditioning is all about <clears throat> you know how you know the ideals the the values of our societies so you, you know, you're, you're not born English or German or Thai or anything. You're not, you're born, you know, you get that identity afterwards. You're not, you know, you're not, that's not a natural state. Those are cultural conditionings. You know, being European or Asian or whatever. These are these are perceptions that you acquire. They're not tamada, tamacha, ordinary. They're artifices, artificial things that human civilization, human beings, you know, create. So when we, we begin to notice that this sense of I'm, you know, I'm British or I'm French, or whatever is something you know that one is a cultural programming now with uh, 
when we observe this, we can observe this identity, this attachment we have to our nationality or any other identity. Being Buddhist, I'm a Theravadan Buddhist, is another one. So you go to Buddhist conferences and then you've got Theravadan Buddhists and Mahayana Buddhists. In Islam, you've got Sunni and Shiite. You know, most of us, until fairly recently, just saw Muslims as Muslims. It's gone kind of monolithic, Islamic condition. And then suddenly we're aware of Sunni and Shiite. Well, it's because Sunni and Shiite are not part of our cultural conditioning. It doesn't, you know, didn't. There's not a strong identity. <clears throat> but for me, being brought up as Christian is Protestant and Catholic. So that, uh, you know, those have more kind of personal, you know, feelings about Protestants and Catholics. So, I mean, this is, this is cultural conditioning. And this is about what politics and racism and sexism and and uh, you know the uh, democracy and communism and fascism and tribes, uh, tribalism and civilization and all the conceits and identities of cultural and social conditioning. Now, in in investigation, and that's, I'm not saying that these are wrong or bad because some. Some are very good identities and some aren't. You know, this, it's not one thing, it's not bad or wrong because conditioned phenomena is, has these values. There's good and there's bad and there's better and worse and so forth and there's appropriate, inappropriate, skillful and unskillful, heaven and hell and what should be and what shouldn't be. But notice, it, when we recognize or realize pure consciousness, then we have perspective on this, this discriminatory function of thought. And the way we attach to thoughts and perceptions. And, and that attachment, out of n not really investigating or understanding anything, we, we take sides, we get caught up in wars and and do terrible things to each other because of of these, this blindness, this ignorance, and this attachment. So when you, you know, like like recognizing the human, the human being, that includes all human beings, whether whatever religion or race or nationality. They all have this, what they call in the modern parlance, Buddha nature. Or this ability of awakened attention to the way it is. So this is, that in the Buddha, uh, you know, in the historical Buddha, you know, proclaimed this 2,550 years ago in India. You know, said so pointed this out, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, this is the uh, the advantage of our human birth because this is within our ability, you know. Where and then in consciousness, it includes everything. So it includes the animals, the insects, and everything, you know. So you begin to uh, kind of open to the universe when you recognize this. You know, your sense of, of opening out, receiving the universe rather than trying to control it and define it. And because the self, the sense of self, oh, it makes me want to control things. I want to protect myself. I feel threatened. You know, I feel my body is a, is a very sensitive form and it easily hurts. It can get cancer. It can be, I could be in an auto accident, I could, 
you know, all kinds of, can go blind and deaf and terrible things can happen. I want to protect myself. And what's mine? I want to protect Amravati from evil forces. So what they do now, they build walls around everything. I hear they're building a huge wall in Baghdad now to protect. <laughs> and then in Jerusalem, the Israelis built a huge wall, a hideous wall. That's to protect, you know, to keep out the these alien forces or the enemy. So there's this wall building, you know, there's a it comes out of this sense of wanting to protect what's mine, what my my family, my group, my clan. <clears throat> Where in awakened consciousness, it includes everything, so there's nothing to, you know, consciousness is unitive. So your relationship to the conditions changes from controlling, fearing, being threatened and being caught up in, in your own likes and dislikes and preferences towards receiving, opening. And in that, as, an, as a human individual, in that open, as a, human, a sensitive form, human body, this thing here, as I allow it, as I let go of these these blind attachments, then I begin to experience, you know, realize that there's nothing to fear. You, you know, fearlessness. There's nothing to fear. There's no separateness, no self that I have to protect or control things. I don't have to spend my my life trying to control everything. I don't have to live here at Amravati and control you all, make sure that that you're all keeping the rules and that you're practicing the way you should and that, you know, the fact we're wagging the finger at you. <laughs> Even though, you know, that's a, a personal tendency. You know, on a personal level, I'm quite capable of doing that. <laughs> so, so uh, because that's how my personality, is, you know, was, was created, you know, through, uh, you know, being punished for disobeying the rules. Being punished for talking back to your father not not being polite to the teacher. You're punished. <laughs> and you're rewarded for being good. At least I was. My background was rewarded. My parents were very good people, so they wanted me to be good. A very natural thing, isn't it? So whenever I was good, they, they you know, I, I'd get all the kind of, you know, love and appreciation when I was bad then Rejection. So, I mean, this is a conditioning, this is how society's conditioned. And, you know, so in a monastery, monastic life, you know, we can use it in the same way, you know, because we're culturally programmed to do it that way. Because all societies are about reward and punishment. That's just the way they operate. The way you, you set learn to live with each other. You've got to punish the, the criminals, put them in prisons, you know, make them, you know, pay for their crimes and so forth. So it's, uh, you know, this is just the way this realm, you know, the human realm and the, the conditioned realm is. So then our refuge is in the unconditioned. So it's not, it's no rejection of the conditioned realm. It's not, not, uh, not coming from an ideal that we shouldn't reward and punish anything. You know, because we can get 
rather sloppy and think all is love and just love everybody equally and and uh, anybody can do what they want, it's okay. And, and we, that's another ideal, you know, of, uh, of that we can, you know, uh, be attached to and not face up to, you know, what, what we're really feeling. So in monastic, in the monastery, I recognize how, how the life does affect consciousness. So you're not just being programmed into being monastics, Buddhist, Theravadan Buddhist monks and nuns. But you're, you know, you're actually learning how to use a convention for awareness as a skillful means. And then there's then this awakened consciousness that's awakened in an individual human. Then, our, then you know what I find is that that naturally flows in doing good. You know, lo- the Brahma Viharas come to life. The m- loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy equanimity. These, these are, this is what consciousness is about. It's about love. And so it's, uh, you know, it's a unitive. Love is, the word, English word love, really what does it mean basically is unity. It doesn't mean liking something. You know, if taken in this way, we use it, oftentimes use love for liking, but Putting love in, in uh, say, unconditioned reality and consciousness. It's unitive. If there was no love, then the, nothing would hold together. And consciousness is what holds everything together, and is what we're experiencing. So when we return or recognize consciousness, and I began to really appreciate just this simplicity, the reality, within the conditions that you're experiencing now, the body that you're experiencing, the state of mind you're in, whatever. Not, you know, you don't have to change it or make it into something else, but learn to trust and recognize your true nature. So then we, then this, this sense of love is not, it's not, doesn't take us into a kind of oblivion of nothingness, a kind of vacuum, a void, which it oftentimes sounds like. Theravada Buddhism can sound like, like the, the aim is to go into nothingness or emptiness so that we don't feel anything. Because you know. logically speaking, you know, when we, when we intellectually uh, start thinking about the way that Theravada Buddhism presents itself, it, it, it sounds quite nihilistic. But that's because it's structured, intellectually structured. Uh, that, that's its structure on the intellectual side. But the Buddha made it very clear it wasn't that. So then, learning to recognize in your own experience, and when you let go of these separative obsessions and attachments and habits, what's left is consciousness. It includes everything. Oneness, wholeness, completeness, and an emptiness too at the same moment. It's empty, it's not mine, it's not, I didn't create it, I'm not, it's not personal anymore. So then relationship to nature, to the environment, to other, to the society we're living in, to, uh, to the world around us, to the stars, the sun and moon, is, what, is, is just a celebration of consciousness rather than personal attainment or a, a high, a kind of, we, get, we can get high and get kind of ecstatic 
and then claim it on a personal level. You can't sustain anything from the personal position. You know, so it, it, because a personal position is basically a, a delusion. But Dhamma is self-sustaining. It's not, I don't have to create it, I don't have to destroy it, I don't have to do anything with it, just recognize it, trust it. So I'll stop here and uh, offer this as a reflection for this evening.